All right. I am here with Dr. Abelson. He is the founder of Abelson Group, which has delivered over 500,000 assessments. Um, he has worked with the Boy Scouts, Intel, um, Depart let's see with the engineers. What was, I'm sorry, I missed that one. The uh, of engineers. Yeah. And then tons of real estate brokerages and agents helping them understand who they are, how to deal with clients, understand their team organization. And he's been doing this since 1986, right? Yes. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. I had the pleasure of meeting you officially on Zoom in July of 2021, where we got to talk about the DISC. I got certified in the DISC. And I had been using the DISC for over six years, and I thought I knew it. I thought I knew how to use it. And I had completely missed half. And I think motivators is more than half of what's going on to really understand how people um, deal with things. So I got to meet you there. I've dove even deeper. I went and bought the actual reference manual. And I think you said, you look, I know most people aren't going to buy this, but then I'm a high C. So I did. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to do my best not to get too deep into the weeds and get into my own personal stuff. I want to make this accessible to everyone. Um, my third highest downloaded podcast is the disc where I talk about it. And there's a line which you said, if someone calls it a personality profile, they don't know the disc very well. Well, that's what I actually titled <laughs> the disc back then, showing that I did not understand the full extent that was not the personality um, side of it, that it is about behavior. So I've learned a lot and I want to thank you for that. Uh, you've been a big part of that and I appreciate you showing up today. Well, it's an, an honor being here and thanks for the invitation, Mike. And and it was it was a pleasure having a chance to meet you through the certification program. And so uh, I'm, I'm excited about what we're going to talk about today. What do most people have as a misunderstanding about what the DISC assessment does and yeah, let's just start there. What's the biggest misunderstanding about the DISC assessment? Well, there, there, there are several. Uh, one of them is, is that there's only one DISC. So if you've, you've taken the DISC assessment, you've taken the DISC assessment, and that couldn't be further from the truth. There are literally dozens and dozens of DISC assessments out there, and most of them are terrible. They're not very accurate. Uh, the reports are either very short or most of it is boilerplate, so it really doesn't get into the individual. Um, and very, very few are compliant with equal employment opportunity law, even though a lot of them are actually used for hiring, but they really shouldn't be used for hiring because they, they may discriminate you know, in hiring practices and organizations. I was just having a conversation uh, last week with somebody who's, who's uh, gonna be working with us. And he said, the organization that he's using right now for assessments, what happens is it's, he hires almost exclusively women of a certain age group. Well, he's discriminating two ways then, you know, one is on age and the other one is on gender, you know, so you have to be careful with Jeff. So number one is that there are many, many different discs out there. And if you're using a disc, ask who you're getting it from for the psychometrics or ask for evidence that it it consistently measures what it says it measures, okay? And you need to do something called face validity where you look to see how accurate it is. And if it's less than 90% accurate, you can get a more accurate one from us and, and other people. The second thing uh, is what you opened up with, and that is that it's personality profile. Uh, the DISC is not a personality profile, it's a behavioral profile. It looks at different types of behaviors. And what I typically find is that organizations will tell you it's a personality profile for one of a couple of different reasons. One of them is they really don't know DISC, as you had mentioned. Okay, they think they do, but they don't because it's so easy, quote unquote, because there's only four behaviors. Well, that's craziness. There's more than the DIS and C. In fact, our, our assessment that we have measures 384 different patterns. All right, so, uh, and it's the most accurate one out there, or at least I haven't found anyone that's more accurate. And I didn't develop it, so I can use any of them out there that I want to, right? The other thing is um, they only sell DISC. They don't sell additional assessments. So they want you to believe that the DISC is the do-all that answers everything, and it isn't, and it doesn't, as you learned in the certification, because one of the other types of uh, things that we measure within somebody's personality is what motivates them. 
all right? So what's underneath the behavior? There's emotional intelligence. There, there's, there's how they deal with stress. There's all kinds of different psychometric types of things that, that, that go on with an individual. There's something called the, the, the MMPI, which I was schooled on. I can't use it anymore for hiring, but I was schooled on in my clinical psych program and training. Um, and that looks at over a dozen different factors of personality. So for people to tell you there's one and it's the disc, they really don't know what they're talking about. So let's talk about what it does measure and what does it measure and measure well? It measures people's behaviors. And if you have a good one, it measures it really well. Uh, and well in, in psychometric language or, or psychology language is if, if, it, if you have a face validity mean, it looks like it's at least 80% accurate or greater, that's considered to be acceptable. All right, regarding regarding a psychological tool or assessment, uh, what we have found that I've done repeated studies on ours that it's ninety percent of the people tell us it's at least ninety percent accurate. I just did another certification last week with with fifteen people in it, uh, and uh, and and all but two said it was ninety five percent accurate or greater. All right, so so you need to have a, a tool that measures what it says it measures, and another important aspect is is it's not i i don't think this is my judgment i don't want to have an assessment tool that judges you i want to have an assessment tool that describes you all right because there's so many different ways to take that information to determine whether it's a good fit or not right so so it, again it's important to, to look at it descriptively and not evaluative or judgment wise right so so it describes the behavior it doesn't tell you whether it's good or bad or excellent or, or poor or or put some type of label on it so so that that's important but again it's behaviors uh the disc primarily looks at four different behaviors and this goes back to 400 bc okay as far as those four general behaviors uh, but then again, ours measures 96 levels of D, 96 level of I, et cetera, et cetera. That's where the 384 comes from. So, so, but again, it just measures behaviors. And then you have the behaviors, which I, I'd learned those very well. I've been working on those for six years. I found this little book that I got to dive a little bit deeper in. And then I learned about the motivators and the motivators. I was having a friend that I was really having trouble pegging on on the disc profile and then once i understood the motivators i was like oh that's why he's showing kind of different here and this here so briefly because we don't have all day for the like the certification but briefly talk about the motivators well we actually have two different uh, levels of motivators one looks at six different types of things that motivate people one looks at 12. let's just look at the six because that's going to be easier with the time that we have, right? But one of the most important aspects of this is that only one of the six primary motives has anything to do with money. So if you can identify what is motivating somebody, then in most cases, you can motivate them without having to pay them more. And which is very important because most people don't realize this, but there's research that demonstrates, and it's been replicated a number of times, that after three or four months of getting a certain salary, even if you didn't feel like you deserved it when you initially got it, you feel that you deserve it. So any benefit of the money kind of disappears because once a motivator becomes an expectation, it's no longer a true, true motivator, it's an expectation, right? So, so what happens with the six motives is, is one of them looks at efficiency and effectiveness. And some people need to be very, very efficient and it deals with efficiency of resources. And money is one of the things that they're efficient on, All right? Another aspect deals with selflessness and giving back to community, which is the opposite of the efficient, right? Because the efficient looks at it as, well, why are you wasting your time by giving away your services to other people, like a Mother Teresa? Well, there, there's all kinds of people that that feel great about that and that is wonderful yeah right? so so if you have somebody on your staff that feels that way well work with them to help others in the organization work with them to help others in the community because that motivates them that makes them feel whole and good about themselves right there's another aspect too that looks at rules and regulations some people like to set the rules and regulations and some people like to have constraints 
And that's motivational for them. So if you put somebody in an environment who likes to have a lot of rules and you don't have any rules, they flounder because they have a hard time making decisions. If you put somebody into an environment that has a lot of rules, but they like to set the rules, but then they're going to resist it, be resistant to the rules. You know, so it's important to, to, to figure out what motivates them. And then the other two, one of them deals with learning for the sake of learning. So they, they had this desire to just to learn and just suck up as much knowledge as they can. All right. So they, they, they're, they're compelled to, to be much more cognitive and heady. The other one deals with, with aesthetics and they're compelled for a balance in life, for the emotional aspect, for, for events. So they like, they, they like going to, to museums, all right? They also, another aspect of the, of the aesthetic is they like a balance in life. So they wanna have a balance between work and home life. Uh, the person who's utilitarian, which was the first one I was talking about, with the efficiency, I mean, if, if they're really efficient with their time and they really like what they're doing, then they might have a problem with the balance because they, they're all in at work, right? So, so there, there's no perfect motive, right, or, or value that goes with this, but they all give us additional insight. And usually where the aha comes from is let's take somebody who's a D, is very competitive, you know, very assertive, you know, likes to do things to be in control, right? Well, but they, you might have two people with very intense Ds or Is or Ss or Cs, but they're very different. Well, one of the reasons for that typically is what's driving the behavior is different. So you can have an intense D who wants to have some structure. You can have a, an intense D who doesn't want to have any structure and wants to set the structure. Well, there are two different people. They have two different values for the organization uh, and they're motivated and they feel good about work when it's structured in different ways. So I'm 95 on theoretical and 58 on utilitarian. So in utilitarian is my third. My second one is social. So how do you, because I don't think you looked at my desk ahead of time, but how, no. do you, how do you see those three playing out for me? Well, you're doing this podcast and part, part of one of the things I find for people who do podcasts is they initially get involved because they like to learn things themselves. OK, so here every time you do a podcast with somebody, you're learning something new yourself. All right. So you suck that up right now. The social comes in because you're sharing this with other people. Right. And you're not making a whole ton of money from your podcast. All right. So you're giving to them. So it's 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 so that's that's a value that that goes with it. it, you know, as far as, as far as those two are concerned and utilitarian comes in because you want to try and do it as efficiently as you can, right? So a podcast is a way to do it. You have a set time. So there's only so much time you can spend on it. So, so we have those three motives going at the same time, right? Uh, and, and, and then there are certain behaviors that you do, but we can describe a lot about you just by looking at the motives, not even looking at the behaviors or the disc. Good point. So my lowest is aesthetic and traditional. I'm a 23 aesthetic. Okay. Um, but I have I have this paint job behind me. I didn't put this up. I wouldn't have paid for this, but it was model home and it came and I love it. I have a mini Cooper that's blue and I ended up putting orange stripes on it. I love sunsets. So my aesthetic is low, which drives my wife nuts, but there's some right. things I really appreciate the beauty but I won't go to that extra level to make those things happen. So is that the utilitarian side going, well, it's not worth the, I'm not going to pay extra for that. I'm not going yeah. to take the time to make that, but if it's there, I'll appreciate it. Yes. That's yes. Well, there's another aspect of that too, because I'm also number six aesthetic and I'm, I'm typically number one or number two utilitarian. Okay. Cause, cause people can't change. Right. But, but um, I, I actually live in a, a condo in downtown Austin that, that is right off of Lady Bird Lake. So I'm looking at the lake all the time and, and I'm paying a lot of money for that view, right? Which, which would go against my utilitarian. My aesthetic is number six. My utilitarian is one or two, but it also deals with value. So what is the value to you? So how much is it worth? It's not just the, the absolute amount of money. It's the value and what it does for you. All right. right. So it's important to keep it's important to keep that in mind, too, as far as what's concerned. Now, the other thing is when we measure these six different aspects of, of what motivates or what you value, you rank order them. So even if you're the lowest on it doesn't mean you don't have any of it. 
It just means in the scheme of things, you have less of it than you have of the other things that, that motivate you or what you view as, as being valuable. So let's, let's go to the, the four letters disc and okay. that graph. So I've met quite a few people who are very high on two of the letters. Like myself, I'm a, I'm a 9386 CS. Okay. I worked with Shireen, who I still work with her. Um, and she's, I don't know her numbers, but she's a very high D, high I. There was something that I was listening to you, and I, I thought I wrote it down, but I can't find it at the moment, was um, about how a C would take on a task. Oh, it was it was bringing people together and that Ds and Cs don't work together too well because they get both task oriented and they run, but then the high S will, um, is a good mediator. So I'm the high S, uh, high S I see. Um, how does that, how, what determines why I switch between the two in certain times? Like I will be people oriented sometimes and I will be task oriented. How would someone predict, including myself, but if someone's working with me, how would they predict when I'm going to be a C and an S in making decisions or whatever? Some of it depends on the context, all right? You know, as far as what, what else is going on for you. Uh, and some of this is, you know, it depends. But again, since ours measure so many different patterns, you know, of the behaviors, you know, there, there are so many different ways to describe, you know, what you'll do. So there might be something going on regarding the motives. That, that gets you to do one thing versus another thing, right? There, there might be other aspects. There might be in one situation, you might have a leadership role. In another situation, you might not have a leadership role. I mean, uh, I, I typically have a leadership role, but I don't always have a leadership role. So when, I, when I'm the leader, I'm, I'm more assertive in moving the process along. When I am not the leader, I hang back a little bit more. Right, because it's a different type of context. So the context is there, and then it depends on the individual. Uh, as as I shared with you before, uh, we measure a lot of different things. I mean, we measure the this behaviors. We measure two different levels of motives. We measure emotional intelligence. We we measure leadership characteristics. We need we measure leader stress and 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 staff stress. Uh, you know, so and all those things go into who we are as an individual. So it might even depend on what stress. You know, how stressful you are. You know, some people, when they're stressed, they behave, you know, differently than when they're not stressed. So, so that has an impact. And it, it's hard to predict, uh, predict behavior, okay, minutely right now. Right. We can predict, you know, whether you have a, this tendency towards the C, which is, means compliance, and it means you, you like detail and you like quality and those types of things are important. Uh, you question a lot. You might be cynical sometimes about what's going on or doubting, right? You know, so, so, but there's multiple patterns that go with all of those descriptors, right? And then on top of that, you have S. So the S's are typically more supportive. They like to do things slow and steady. That doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. This is another misnomer. Uh, people think S's are slow psychologically. That's craziness. There's no relationship, at least I haven't found any studies that shows any relationship between intelligence or IQ and D, I, S, or C, right? But D's prefer to do things quickly. S's prefer to do things more methodically, okay? So, so they may come across as being slower because they like to do things at a slower, more methodical pace, right? You know, so, so I would have to see you in your situation a little bit more or give you an assessment and then read what the assessment tells me because the assessments are great because there they're are literally about 20,000 different iterations of wow. our disk assessment. And the reason for that is if you have two people that are identical twins and even answer the questions identically, right? The reports are not identical because they would lose face validity. People wouldn't think that they're, they're valid because it says the same thing, right? But it says the same thing, but it uses different words, okay? To get the message across. And that's why we have so many different iterations, which, which increases people's confidence that it really is them. Right. Let's go through a couple of, or a few rapid fire. Um, I'm going to bring up some stuff and you tell me which profile they're more likely to be. Oh, okay. It's, it's a test. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not for you. It's not a test. This is easy for you. So who's the self-starter typically? Uh, typically the self-starters are the Ds. All right. Uh, they're, they're great self-starters. They're lousy finishers. 
This is why the S and the C are good compliments to them because they're the ones who get things done. The C yes. is the persistent one, right? Well, the S is really the persistent one. The okay. C is the detail one. All right. Okay. So it so so that that that's really what's going to happen, you know, in, in that. So that so the C is going to keep on asking questions. Uh they'll be persistent that way. All right. Uh but uh but the, the C is gonna the, the S is gonna stay at it methodically to get get it done. And S is prefer to be working on maybe two, three, or four things at a time, rarely more than that. Whereas the D's like to have a dozen or two dozen things on their desk at the same time. I view it as is the is the D's are going around opening up boxes. OK, and, and the S's are going around trying to put lids on the boxes before they before the D decides to reshape the box. That is. And, and you gave that example a couple of weeks ago in a Zoom. And I literally had put a lid on top of a box for a high D the day before. That is <laughs> it's so true. And what I found is that D's make decisions fast they'll, and they'll change their mind fast, which is annoying to a high S. Want stability this way. We're going to do it. Let's do it that way. Right. Well, this isn't what you said yesterday. Exactly. Why, did, why did you change your mind? OK, well, I've thought more about it or truthfully, I don't even remember what I told you yesterday. And they're not going to admit that. But that that's part of the reason. And they don't even understand why you're bothered by it. If you have a very intense D, yes, it's kind of like just just get on with it. You know, just do what I tell you to do and don't ask me why. Why are we still don't talking about why. this? Just do it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the glass is half full or empty. Can you kind of give uh, how the personality or the profile see that? See, I said personality. Sure, the, the glass down. half full is going to be your eye because they're very optimistic uh, and they're very trusting. The glass half empty is going to be your C, you know, because because they're, they're questioning, they're cynical. They have to have evidence that it's true before before they're going to buy into it. So if you're working with somebody who's a fairly intense C, either training wise or, uh, or, or in a job or in sales or anything like that, uh, you better come with the data. You better come with the information uh, because they're gonna be asking you know, all kinds of questions. And if you can't answer them, then, then their confidence in you starts to go away. So true as a high C, I will agree with that. And this is actually, um, we in, in the Beaverton, Portland area, there's a lot of uh, engineers. We have Intel and Tektronics, uh, things up here. So we work with engineers. and. Um, I just tell people, if someone asks you the data, you cannot blow them off. If you blow them off, and why you ask that, they won't argue with you. You just won't see them again. Right. That data Don't is important to them. Even though we know that data doesn't matter, they think it is, you at least have to acknowledge it and maybe show them why that's not the best way. But if you ignore it, you'll lose them. Yeah, let me make some comments on that. That. that... The way I view it and the way I say it is I've never met an engineer who had too many specs, all right? They, they love to have those specifications because it gives them some framework. It gives them a guideline from which to make decisions because they want to be accurate. It's got to be right, okay? You know, so it's, it's, it's very important that that, that happens. Uh, the other thing is, and the way to deal with that is to ask them up front, what do you need to know for you to make a decision? And just as important, is it your decision to make or is it somebody else's decision to make? You're just gathering the data for them, okay? Because that's very important to know because if it's somebody else's decision to make, you wanna get them involved in the conversation quickly, all right? But the C typically won't tell you that, all right? Because they won't accept responsibility and they view it as their job because that's the structure they've been given, okay? By their boss or somebody else to get the information and then relay it back to whoever is the true decision maker. That doesn't mean that the C can't be the decision maker. All I'm saying is frequently it's not the C themselves that is making the decision. You need to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who's more patient? Oh, the S's are the most patient. No question about it. Uh, I'll do an exercise when I do a team building program and I'll put people in, in the four different quarters uh, of, of, of a room, and then we'll, we'll go over a small part of, of the report so they get a feel for what the D, I, S, and C is. And I always start with the Ds because they are the most impatient. All right. And then, and then what will happen is I'll typically go to the Cs, you know, to, to, to get theirs. And by that time, the I's are chatting away, okay, uh, you know, because they're talking because they can't stand it anymore, that nobody's paying attention to them. All right, so so then I go to the eyes, and then the S's are the easiest ones to, to deal with because they're the most patient. Uh, and that's fine with them. They don't have to go first. In fact, they prefer not to go first uh, as long as as long as you attend to what their needs are. So they'll they'll wait until it's their turn. 
you know what I did a lot of zoom classes and you know we did the certification I did some other things that were classes and what I noticed was on the first session I would rarely say anything I'm sitting back assessing what's going on you know what's appropriate to whatever but then after that then I start talking more and you I think you'd said something in one of the trainings and it's something I heard was that I it's just my tendency I sit back I want to see what's going on first and someone said after a meeting, like, man, Mike doesn't talk much, but when he does talk, he says something great or useful or whatever. Cause they were, cause they were high eye and wondering why I wasn't talking. I was just waiting for the right time. Cause I wanted to be sure what I said was right and useful. And so, yeah. That's the C and the social coming out at the same time. Okay. Because you, you know, you, you want it to be right, but at the same time, you want it to be significant and meaningful for other people. So th those are the types of things that you'll wait till you have to share. So I would suspect that that, uh, that in a lot of cases, uh, you don't share what's on your mind because you don't think it's important enough. And you just keep it to yourself unless somebody asks you. Yep. That's what the one was, was you should, you were talking about, you should not, if you're talking to an S, ask them how they feel. And if you talking to a C, ask them what they think. Right. Um, right. You don't want to get into the feelings with the C. The C typically, you know, doesn't doesn't appreciate doesn't appreciate uh, the feelings. Doesn't want to get into it. They don't like to be touched. They don't like you get too too close to them physically either. Typically, all right. Now, all these things are typical, or all these things depend on the extent that they are a D, I, S, or C. Because to some extent, uh, I, I'm making some comments that will make people think there only are D's or I's or S's or C's. The reality of it is only about 7%, uh, at least the people using our assessment, only about 7% are what we would call pure D's, I's, S's or C's. That means that, that about 93% of the population is a blend of at least two of the different styles. So, uh, so you need to take that blending into consideration when you're thinking about the person. And that's another reason why our assessment comes in so handy because it does it for you. And the assessment actually describes all kinds of neat stuff about the individual. So you don't have to understand it yourself. All you have to do is be able to read. Uh, and our assessments are written, written at the fifth to the eighth grade level. And those people can, can do that. In fact, our assessments are actually in over 40 different languages. So if you're in a multi you know, language type of organization, uh, you can use our assessments and people who, who have Spanish or French or Portuguese or whatever their language is, uh, German, you know, as their first language, they can take it in that language and they can get the report in that language, but we can also convert it to English. All right. So so the people who are don't speak that that other language can get a report that says the same thing. So it's it, it's really cool how the reports are really the bottom line on understanding what somebody is like, because, again, you don't have to figure it out yourself. Uh, the, the the reports are wonderful. It's mine's 49 pages. It talks about my strengths. It talks about my weaknesses. When I coach. I really get into the disc because it gives us this common language to talk about. Um, and it, and once you validate it and go through it, you know, they're saying they agree that their strengths are this and their weaknesses are this and the places they should work on are this. And you come back to it when there's something going on and hey, what about this? What about that? It, it is an amazing tool that I'm so glad <laughs> exists. It's, it's just a fantastic tool that you have. Um, I, I really love it too. And, and to me, one of the best sections of that report is a time waster section. Yes. Where, where it actually gets into how they may be wasting time, why they may be wasting the time and recommendations on what they can do to decrease the amount of time that they waste. And it's typically one and a half to three and a half pages of, of, of the report that you were talking about. And, and, it usually identifies four to seven different ways that they waste time. And what I do when I'm interacting with people is I have, I work with, have them work on one of those areas at a time. Mm -hmm. And I'll use, I'll use the, the comments in the report as a framework to have a discussion and then work with them in a coaching way to, uh, to, to, to get them to see what they're doing that they can decrease or stop doing that waste time, but more importantly, what other things they can do to help them decrease the amount of time they waste. And the way I present it is the cost of the report is so min minimal. Um, and, and, and for sure, the, the time waster section is worth 
you know, whatever we would charge you for this report. Just, just, just think if you could save one hour a week, just one hour a week. So that's over 50 hours a year. How much would that be worth to you? Yeah. I mean, it's got to be worth thousands of dollars. I, I mean, that's, that is, that, that's incredible. You know, when we charge, you know, less, I mean, we, we charge less than $200 for the report, you know, so it's, it's, it's just, it's just an incredible, incredible way to, to, uh, to leverage, to leverage your money and, and leverage the report. So a couple of my time wasters are want to be certain slash prepared. Um, that's a huge one for me is, yeah. and, and which follows up with the next part, want to avoid mistakes. I, I hate to be wrong. I hate to make mistakes because it goes back on to who I am, my identity, um, um, high standards for work performance. So you're reading from your report, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and, and there are ways to, I mean, one of the ways to deal with not wanting to make mistakes is instead of coming up with the one answer, right? I would say, Hey Mike, why don't you give me two or three options and, and, and I'll make the final decision using the information that you've collected. And all of a sudden I've just allowed you to escape from being wrong. And I'm not, I'm not concerned about being right or wrong. I just wanted, I just wanted a workable, good decision so we can move forward together because that's my D and my DI coming in. Whereas your C is to collect the data, you know, and to give me recommendations. So most of my listeners are gonna be real estate agents. I'm self-employed as well. So how do I do that without someone else to go to show, show this to? And like, here's yeah, my report option. on yourself. Okay, read the report, mm -hmm. look at the time wasters, pick one of those areas that you wanna do something about. It gives some suggestions regarding why you may be wasting time. It gives some suggestions on how you can stop, you know, wasting time or what you can do that's different. I mean, if you have a significant other or if you have a good friend, you know, share it with them. It doesn't have to be a coach, right? Uh, just share it with them and, and maybe they can give you some ideas. And then you decide, you decide, don't do it just because they're suggesting it. You decide what will work for you and then start practicing it. And that's, that's all it takes. It, it's as, as the phrase goes, you don't have to be a brain surgeon, all right, to, uh, to be able to use these things, right? All you have to do is be a, a, an average normal human being um, and we can define average however we want to. Let's talk no a few. Real, there's no real definition of <laughs> average in our culture, I hate to tell you. <laughs> no. <laughs> let's, um, let's give the listeners a few uh, tips to help them with their clients. Like I said, mostly this is real estate agents. So if they're a high D, how should they treat them in the process of working with them? You want to be specific. Uh, you want to structure it so, it so they win, right? You don't want to win. You'll win when they win, all right? Um, and, um, and, and don't put them, don't, put, don't pressure them too much to do something, all right? Let them make the decision. You can give them some options as well and let them make the decision. If they say, what would you do? My advice is always in that case. Well, why don't you tell me what you're thinking first and I'll be more than happy to share with you what, what, what I think you know, uh, is the right thing. After all, if you're a realtor, you're supposed to bring some expertise to the relationship. So you should have some expertise to bring uh, and you can use that expertise, but don't, don't put them you know, in, in a box where they have to just do one thing. They're going to resist you, even if it's the greatest idea in the world. Okay. Um, what about the higher eye? The high eye, what you need to watch out for is the amount of time that, that you have and you need to watch out. You, Start near the beginning of the conversation. How much time do we have? Okay, and then utilize that uh, to to move forward in the process, whatever your process is, whether it be selling or listing, or whether you're just trying to get to know them. All right, um, and remind them when the time is near that you know we're almost near the the time. If they don't come up with the time, then you can structure a time and say how much time that you have. All right. The other thing is you need to keep them on track, and the third thing is ask them to write down notes. Uh, and if they don't remember it themselves, you can say near the end of the conversation, what are the two or three things that were most important to you from our conversation? And if they can't come up with two or three, you can say, well, is it all right to share with you what I thought was important in our conversation? And if that's the case, can you write these down? You know, uh, the ones that you agree with, and then you just do that. Yeah, the high eyes, what I found is you can lose a lot of time because they just want to 
converse and connect and and that's just their way so pulling in who they early, are, that's important to them and that's which is fine tough. you need to respect that but the same regard if you're trying to do business uh you need to set some time timelines uh and some constraints as well and they'll typically go along it because they want to please you that's one of the neat things about very very high intense eyes they want to please you mm. And I find this with agents who have trouble getting their calls done, their goal is that they end up on these conversations that take an hour, hour and a half. And like, I just, I didn't have time. So it's putting that a little bit shorter. So the, the high S, what's the best way to deal with them? The best way to deal with an S is to, is to be programmatic. If, if there's a task that has to be done, talk with them about what is the endpoint and then work back as far as the different steps in the process. Mm -hmm. You also have to, if you're a D, you can't be talking this quickly. Just slow down the tad, right? Because if you're talking too quickly and you're too intense, that shuts a very, very intense S down, all right? So, so you don't want that to happen. Also, you want to be supportive of them. And you don't want to give them too many tasks to be working on at one time. They, they like to feel the accomplishment of getting things done. So, so work with them that, that way. One of the biggest problems I find is you have all these intense Ds that, that like to hire Ss. They go away to a training or a conference. They come back with a dozen or 15 great <laughs> ideas. Yes. And they just dump them on the Ss desk. Okay, And the S is sitting there like, Sure. Okay. But the S is thinking, of mine, I already have 30 things that are on my, are on my agenda. How do I deal with these other 15 or these new 15 that they put on my desk? Right? So I have some advice. If you're an S remind the D of all the things that you're working on already and say to them, how do you want it to be reprioritized and put that back on the D does two things. Number one, they've probably forgotten half the things that they've asked you to do or half the things you're working on. And it's a good refresher that you tell them that. And number two, they might have changed their mind and there might be some things that are on your agenda that are no longer important for them or they are less important, right? So, so put it back on the D uh, regarding, regarding setting a priority. And if they say, well, you do it, then you do it as the S and then come back and ask for permission. All right. This is the priority that I've done. OK, and I put these lower and I put these higher and, you know, I'm no longer working on these because I just don't have time and then get the D to respond. Okay. What I've found with with higher S clients is um, they need to see where the stability is on the other side, going from renting an apartment where they can give a 30 day notice where they could just move somewhere else, feeling like their neighbors. You have to show them st where the stability is on the other side. And make that bridge easier for them. I've had a lot of first-time home buyers, and I'm guessing that they were S's that they got really close. They're like, "Oh yeah, we like this house. We'll call you tomorrow to write up the offer," and then they disappear for two weeks. And then they come back, and they said, "Oh, I got overwhelmed," or they come up with another reason. And I'm wondering if that's that S personality in that. I I think that's I think that's the S, but I think it's also the C. OK, because what's happening in that type of situation is is they're coming up with different things or different ideas, or maybe they saw another house. If as a realtor, if you think the only people they're talking to are you, uh, you, you better think again. OK, because they're looking at the Internet, you know, they're looking around, you know, for different things. I don't care what the style is, uh, unless they're really, really high eye and they really trust you or they're an S uh, and your family member. OK, they're going to be looking around. They're going to be talking to other people. They're going to be going on the Internet. And if they're a C, they're going to be thinking about, well, geez, that was really cool. And that's house and the house that the realtor showed me doesn't have this. Uh, maybe I can get this, too, and it won't cost me any more just to cost me a little bit more. You know, maybe I'll just ask. I'll just ask them, you know, so they get a list of two or three or four things like that, because the C likes to have a lot of, you know, likes to have the detail and wants it to be perfect. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and that could take days. So you want to come up with anybody, whether it's a DIS or C, as far as when's the next time we're getting together type of thing. So they don't have that opportunity to do too much of that thinking about other things, because there's no such thing as a perfect house. If you've had a house built, you actually realize even building your own house, there's no such thing as a perfect, perfect house, because there are some compromises you have to make, or some new stuff comes upon or comes out after you've already finished that, or you're past that in your stage of building the house. Buying a house is the same thing, okay, whether it's, whether it's, whether you're buying from the dirt up, or whether you're buying it that that's moving ready. Hmm. I'm not sure if there's a, 
I'm curious about the answer to this, I guess. Who handles pressure better? A lot, a lot of sales is pressuring people, unfortunately, and I'm not a big pressure person. Maybe that's my SC, but um, you said that the D doesn't like pressure, which kind of surprised me. I know they like options, but in these pressure sales where you see people like, hey, you need to do this today, we're going to miss out, there's multiple offers, which of them respond well to pressure and which need that time to think about it? Well, a D will, well, D will be okay with that type of pressure. Okay. All right. The type of pressure they won't be is when you structure it win-lose and they're losing. Okay. Okay. What's going right. to happen is, is they're going to, th then they're going to change uh, or do certain things to deal with, to deal with that, the stress that you just put on them. Right. But if there's options where they could win-win and it's, and it's a level of how big they win. All right. Or, or how close, you know, the particular house is. Uh, there, there are certain markets where if, if you don't make a decision right there on the spot, uh, then, then you get put in a pool of other, of other offers, you know, and the question is, you, at that point, if you're, buy, if you're the buyer, you never know what the list is going to look at. You know, they, all cash might have an impact. Um, it might not have an impact. It might be they can make an extra five or ten or fifteen or twenty five thousand dollars this way or that way. Uh, some some uh, some of your uh, sellers, you know, are more into the security aspect of it. So what kind of job do you have and how stable is your job? You know, and are you going to have a hard time getting funding or not? You know, so there there are those types of things that 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 go into it. But I mean, these don't have a they don't they like giving you that pressure. All right. And they don't have that much trouble with the pressure. Yes. Eyes, you know, are very optimistic. So they also don't have that much, you know, you know, with the pressure, they all deal with it. Um, and both of them, D's and I's, are optimistic enough to the point where they feel if they make a wrong decision, they'll be able to compensate for it mm. and they'll be able to change it uh, and, and, and deal with, with what's come, come on the line. Now, I want, want you, again, I want to remind everybody that there isn't just one level of D, I, or S, or C. We're talking about dozens of levels and patterns of each one of these because most people are a, are, are a combination all right, of, uh, of, of multiple uh, sets of the DIS and C. Okay. Well, in my few last minutes, I just want to make sure we cover your A-Learn program. We're, we're very proud of it. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, of restructuring a little bit right now, but we actually have multiple levels, all right? Uh, the silver level of A-Learn, what A-Learn is, it's a, uh, it's, brief videos it is brief articles and brief is three to five or six minutes are most of the videos all right brief articles are one or two pages because my readers don't like to have to go through a whole bunch of stuff the the, the videos and the um the articles are very applied and then we have some longer webinars right now we have 200 different assets in there uh, that, and they all relate to being a more effective leader uh, or to use our assessments better uh, and, uh, and, and we talk about power, we talk about motivation, we talk about leadership style. I've done research on, on many of these different areas. I do uh, presentations. I've done, I stopped counting a number of years ago after my thousandth uh, presentation to adult audiences. I don't even count uh, the 30 plus years I was a teacher uh, at Texas a and um, retired emeritus professor uh, from there. Uh, and, uh, but, but anyhow, so, so they're very applied. They're very, very useful. Uh, the silver level is free. And the silver level has uh, videos on how to use our assessments. So if you're one of our clients, our, or if you become one of our clients, there's free videos for you. They're always going to be free because I want you to be able to use assessments. I'll make the money when I sell you the assessments or when I sell you the more extensive training. But, but so silver is free. The gold level has all of our articles, all of our uh, webinars, uh, or all of our uh, uh, videos in it. Um, and it's structured as, as classes. Um, as well as individual ones. So it's, it, it's very easy to use. It's very economical. It hardly costs anything at all. And then we have our platinum level where we, uh, we're actually building that level out more. Uh, you get an automatic 10% on all of, our, all of our products and training and, and consulting. You get, um, uh, we're, we're setting up networks within there. Uh, you get free access to me to ask questions. Uh, so there are those types of things for the platinum level, and the platinum level is only fifty percent more than the than than the gold level. So it's it's definitely it's definitely worth it. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, you know, if you want to learn more about us, just go to Abelson, my last name, A B E L S O N dot net. 
uh, and I spell it the biblical way. So it's A B E L S O N, uh, not the other way. Uh, and go, and then you can you can see what we have. Um, you can go in and, and check out the ALR and register for silver. It doesn't cost you anything. It never will. Uh, and see what those videos are. Uh, and if you like them, then you might want to explore in the gold area. You can you can actually sign up on a monthly basis, a yearly basis. You get a year for the price of 10 months. This has been a blast. I think I could talk for hours about this. I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And I'm checking out those classes on there. Um, is there any last thing that you really think everyone should know about the disc and to, to make it work for them? Well, if, if you really want to understand disc and or you really want to better understand yourself and want to understand disc and motives, we have a certification program. And I, that's, Mike, what, what you went through. Yep. There's actually two different certification programs. We're involved with uh, success coaching. So if you're a coach, you want to enroll in the success coaching program. It's a phenomenal program. It's five days long. Uh, two of the days are mine. Three of the days you know, are other, other aspects. And the fifth day, we tie it all together. It truly is a phenomenal program. Uh, if you're not a coach, um, then there you go. Uh, if you're not a coach, uh, then then we have uh, we have a, a, a disc emotives certification program. Uh, it, it's great for trainers. It's great for people who are hiring. It's great for managers and leaders. Uh, it is uh, eight three hour sessions uh, over a month. So it's uh, it, it's very very doable. It's very very applied. Uh, you get a, you get two workbooks, a workbook on the disc and a workbook on the motives, and then you get uh, verbatim uh, of, of a, a video um, platform for one for the disc and one for the motives, um, and then you get our A Learn. You know, get all that and you have it for a month. It's a phenomenal course, and then of course you have me for the entire month. Any question you want to ask about it. So if you're interested, go to Ableson.net. Uh, and uh, check it out or sign up. We're doing another one. Uh, we typically do three or four a year. We have another one coming up next month. So if, if you're interested at all, now is the best time to register. We keep we we cap it at 12 people. That way you're all getting a lot of attention and there's a lot of casework and there's a lot of work where you work with other people. So it's a great way to learn the disc. And Mike, you know what you said, you know, at the beginning where you thought you knew disc, most of our people think they know DISC until they enroll, and then it's kind of like, oh, my God, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Uh, and, and that's only about a quarter of what I know about DISC and motives. So, so there, there, there's a lot to learn about it, uh, and we also have other programs to deal with it, but that would be the best place to, to start. Or you can always just call me. Uh, it's abelson at abelson.net is my email address. Uh, so email me and we can have a conversation. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so just tell me who you are and that you want to talk or we can email back and forth for a little bit. I'd be delighted. I, I, I enjoy those kind of conversations. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And we will uh, we need to do this again sometime. It'd uh, be my pleasure. And thanks for inviting me to do it this time. And everybody out there, um, let us know what we can do. And of course, I'm sure you're listening to all, all Mike's podcasts. Uh, and I'm and I'm surely high educational because he's already told you he's a high theoretical. So he's only going to do those things that are highly educational. <laughs> oh man, it's it's fun to look at these things and see exactly you put out on paper. That's what the disc is. It's you written out. It's your, almost like your user's manual. It is, and people look at this and they say, "How did you do? How did you know that?" With how, these very weird questions. <laughs> but it is, and we do it. And I've been awesome. delighted to work with you out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike.